Welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. This is your host, Michael Brandvold. I'm flying solo today as Jay is slammed with some clients today. So before I introduce this week's special guest, I just want to do a quick shout out and thank you to Bruce and everybody over at HypeBot. Thank you, bands in town. Everything you do to support and promote the Music Biz Weekly podcast is greatly appreciated. And of course, to DiscMakers.com. Thank you for your continued sponsorship. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small that selling products like CD, vinyl, t-shirts at gigs when they return and your online store has become an important income generator. For every CD you sell at a gig, you'd need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money, and that's a lot of streams. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even t-shirts. So we put together a cool little offer for all of the Music Biz Weekly podcast listeners out there. Head over to discmakers.com, place an order for 100 or more CDs, and when you check out in the promo code field, enter free biz, F-R-E-E-B-I-Z, free biz, and you'll save up to $150 in shipping costs. So head over to discmakers.com, 100 or more CDs, promo code free biz, and save yourself some money. So this week, I have a great special guest and a great conversation this week. And it's all about music business education, colleges, universities, music business programs. We are joined by Susan Dotis from NYU, and she's going to talk to us all about what to look for in programs, what, what's important, what's needed for applications, talks about the staff, the professors, everything, internships, this is a great listen if you're somebody who wants to get into the music business. So let it roll, Susan Dotis. There we go. Okay. Um, so we're just going to get into our conversation here, and then when we're done, sure. I'll record my opening and intro and stuff like sure. that. So everybody out there in Music Biz Weekly Podcast world, listeners and watchers all over the world, I want to welcome Susan Dotis to the show this week. And Susan, you can probably do yourself more justice than if I just read verbatim your little bio here. Why don't you give us a little background first on what you've done? Okay. So uh, I'm a longtime music business executive on the talent side. Started my career as a music publisher um, at Chapel Music in Warner Chapel. Uh, then went on to be a senior A&R executive at both MCA Universal and Sony Music. Uh, and then ha uh, I've had my own company for quite a long time, specializing in A&R &R consulting, but also mostly managing producers and engineers. So my producers produce Bon Jovi, Sting, Chris Bodie. My engineers worked with Christine, Christine Aguilera all, all across the musical spectrum. Um, and for the last 10 years, in, in addition to all my music business work, um, I have um, sort of segued into academia. And now I'm a professor of music business studies at NYU Steinhardt School in New York City. So, and, and, and that's sort of going to be the segue into what we're going to discuss today, because when you reached out to us, um, and I'll just kind of paraphrase what you said, but you go, I've noticed that more and more frequently, I'm contacted by young people and parents from all parts of the country, even overseas, to explain and discuss the various music business and music tech degree programs that are now being offered by big and small colleges and universities around the country. What do they teach? How are they relevant? Are they necessary for young people who wish to work in the music industry or in the recording and engineering side of the business and a myriad of other important and sometimes amusing questions. And that's a that's something Jay and I, which I apologize, Jay is is not going to be with us today because he's just slammed with some of his clients. 
this is something we we always have felt strongly about is you know and and I, and I don't want people to take this the wrong way but this business can be filled with a bunch of scam artists very true <laughs> um it's very easy to build a website that looks nice and you throw a bunch of logos up there and you throw a bunch of names up there and you look like you're important right and there's nobody that's vetted that out so how 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 to you how do you vet out these programs how do you decide is this legit what are some of the things you can look for to determine if this is real or if this is going to be something where in three months i'm out ten thousand dollars and gain nothing well you know i i come to this primarily from the um you know not for not for profit public and private universities the the um you know the world of uh recognized universities across the united states however i'm well aware that there are many quote unquote schools that offer degrees that are for profit schools and right. the first thing i would say absolutely um is to determine, first of all, have you ever heard of this university? And second of all, is it for profit or not for profit? Um, I mean, there's definitely a difference between the University of Southern California and, you know, some of these for profits, the Detroit Institute of uh, Music, Dime, I think it's called, you know, these are for profits, they're, they're different. And they do different things. And the other thing you have to look at is what degree are they offering? Are they offering a four-year bachelor's degree? Are they offering some kind of diploma? You, you really have to be able to figure out, you know, what is the school attempting to offer you? Um, and, and I think that that's the first step because based on what they're offering is gonna determine whether it's the right fit for a particular person or not. But again, I, you know, I come from, I, I'm now sort of what they call a practitioner academic all my years in the music business, I have a master's degree from Columbia University. You know, I'm, I'm working at a level where, you know, yes, I'm teaching in a music business studies program, but, but we're a four year, you know, uh, bachelor's degree program at a major university in NYU. That, that brings other elements into the program and the process. It's much different than a school that's offering you two years of, you know, how to be in the music business, two completely different experiences. Yeah, you know, and, and, and because I, I do so much in, in social media and online marketing, it, it brings to mind, I see these, these programs that offer you a degree in social media to make you a social media, and, 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 and I can see through it because, listen, that's not a bachelor's degree. That's not even a liberal arts degree. That's, exactly. that's a made up diploma exactly. that the school is giving you to say, congratulations, you completed your course. Right. It's not a, a legitimate credential, I guess is what I would say. Well, exactly. I mean, again, I would say the most important thing is to decide what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get a college education? Or are you trying to get some sort of certification that you know how to do something? They are two extremely different things. I mean, I started my career teaching here in the United States at the University of New Haven in Connecticut, which is a you know, major university with a, uh, a music, music business and music tech program, all three areas with 300 students. I mean, you're getting a bachelor's degree because you have to, you know, engage with many aspects of the university um, in order to achieve that degree. Again, that's very different than some kind of certificate in, you know, like you said, social media marketing. I mean, you want to you want to become an expert in social media marketing? Go out and do it. Yeah, that, that's my opinion on a lot of this stuff. Go out and do it. Engage and do it. Um, I don't really think you need to go to school for that. Well, so that, that kind of leads to the, the question I was going to ask is, and, and, and I get this all the time from people who just want, want me to give them a little bit of advice. Do you need to go to a college to get a music degree, a formal degree, to get into the music business? Is it going to 
put you ahead of the curve? Is it going to give you more advantages over somebody who is street educated, so to speak? Um, I used to think the answer to that was no. Um, but, but, you know, with more than a decade under my belt at teaching in major university programs and, and um, knowing about the major universities in this country that offer those programs, I would say there is an advantage to getting a degree in music business or music tech from one of the top programs in the country. You know, USC, NYU, uh, Belmont University, Drexel, Syracuse University, um, Northeastern in Boston has a pretty good program, right? Uh, University of Miami, right? These are not only real schools where you're getting um, a, a bachelor degree and a liberal arts education. So you're also learning how to think and critically analyze and do all the things right. that a human should be able to do to engage in the world. And particularly if you're engaging with artists and creators, right? Being able to speak and discuss things in an intelligent, analytical way is really important. Um, aside from that, the big difference between going to those kind of universities and uh, just trying to find a job on your own is the nature of the faculty and the connections between those universities and the music business. One of the biggest um, pluses of attending, let's say, NYU is the fact that our entire faculty, we come from all different kinds of academic and professional backgrounds related to music and media, but all of us bring aspects of the music industry to our students and to our program. So the whole time you're in our NYU program, you are meeting top executives, artists, creators from all aspects of the music business all the time. And you are required to do at least two vetted internships at well-known companies, which obviously our program helps you uh, to get. So the ability to make contacts in the business and use those contacts to find employment when you graduate is a huge, huge um, plus for programs at the universities that really understand how to provide this kind of education. Um, and that's the other thing. These programs exist at a lot of well-known universities. But if you're not attending a university that's in the epicenter of the music business, LA, Nashville, New York, or being close enough, right? right. Philly, Boston, New Haven, right? You know, Northern California, right? I'm not sure how you're getting access to, to the epicenter of the business. I'm not sure why you would maybe do one of these programs at a school in Minnesota. As nice as Minnesota is, if you right. know what I mean. You right. know. So um, I, I do think um, that our students and our graduates um, have a leg up because they come into these jobs understanding various basic aspects of the music business is how it works. They understand, let's say, in the world of music publishing, mechanical rights, sync rights, performance rights, they understand the basics of these things. They know what a PRO is. They understand how uh, digital distribution works, Right, they, they know these things, so they come in aware, ready to get right into the job. Of course, it's an entry level job usually, but they come with some background and experience and they're able to move through the business through the context that they've built while they've been you know, in, in one of these programs. Do you think one, you know, getting into one of these programs um, is better than, you know, a lot of times people go, well, how do I start managing a band? And, you know, my advice is um, go find that local band playing the bar that you happen to love that nobody cares about and offer to start working for them. You're going to do it for free, but you're going to get in at the ground level and you're going to learn. You, you'll, you will probably learn things that aren't even taught in school. You're going to, you, you'll, you'll probably learn a lot quicker the unsavoriness that you will deal with when it comes to booking at a venue and trying to collect payments after a show and, you know, the frustrations of promotion and marketing and all that sort of stuff. Is, 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 that, a, is that still a great benefit for somebody to just go out there, 
and find that local band you like and offer your services, be it a photographer, graphics, internet, management, merchandising, whatever it might be? Absolutely. Uh, it's foolish to think that you can sit in my classroom or in our program at NYU for four years, not engage with the music business and come out and be a desirable uh, potential employee for a big music company. We want you to be in the music business even before you get to our program. If you read my bio on the NYU website, you know, one of the things I always say to my students is, if you wanna be in the music business, then be in the music business. Figure out what you can do and go out and do it while you're in school or for those of you who are majoring in philosophy and you wanna be in the music business, do that as well. It's absolutely critical for people to be out there getting experience on their own, managing a local band, doing social media marketing for your roommate's band, um, you know, getting out there and seeing if you can you know, work with clubs in your local um, uh, city or area and see if you can help bring bands into the clubs. Look, that's how I started. That's how most of the people from my generation started. We were absolutely madly and crazily passionate about music. Um, we had no idea how to get in the business, you know, is, is it door number one, door number two, door number three, and what's behind the door? You had to know somebody's uncle's cousin's brother-in-law knew somebody that maybe could call on your, we, we didn't have any of these programs or anybody leading the way, any, any, you know, internship and recruitment programs. We had to just get out there and do it and figure out what we were interested in the business and, and work our way through that way. So every one of my students is doing something involved in the music business in addition to being a student at NYU. Is, does this all the same philosophy apply to audio production? So if you wanted to just be an engineer or ultimately be a producer, because even though that is in the music business, you could argue that if you're gonna be an engineer, you don't really need to understand royalties. You don't need to understand PRO. It, you know, it, it, it's now- I disagree, it, I disagree with that and teach music tech students all the time that they absolutely must know some of the basics. They must know some of the basics. Because think of it this way, Mike. In today's world of creation, particularly in hip hop and pop, right? There's anywhere between five and 10 different writers. Sure. Yep on a track, right? So what are they doing? Some of them are creating beats, some of them are creating loops, right? So that could be the engineer or producer who's just sitting there during a session and comes up with something. And the artist says, that's great, just add that onto the track. Next thing you know, the engineer is now a writer. What does that mean for the engineer? The engineer now has a piece of that copyright. How do they understand the process of monetizing their piece of the copyright? So almost all the music tech students in the programs I'm familiar with take some sort of business structures, intro to music business course to learn those basic things. Because in today's creative world, they're not just sitting you know, in a windowless studio for 18 hours a day. They, they are involved with all different aspects of the creative process and at any time they could be a participant in that. Um, particularly for producers. Producers today are also writers, producers, yep you know, have, have, have taken on a variety of, of roles now within the music production process. So for, for a producer to not understand um, uh, rights, uh, rights that are um, uh, available to a creator, I think they're leaving money on the table. Do you, do you think that some of these schools that are out there that are like, come here and we'll teach you how to mic and we'll teach you how to run a board are they providing that sort of background in the music business or are they just focused on the technical skill? And this is the difference between, you know, that technical college and going to a, a, a real college. Yeah, I think you're talking about the difference between a technical college and going to a, you know, a liberal arts university where you're getting a liberal arts degree with a focus on music business or music tech. Um, Listen, you know, these technical schools prepare you for a very specific job. And it's, if your job is you want to be an audio engineer and you learn the basics of audio engineering at a technical school, yeah, great. You know, you could 
become, you know, the next major, you know, engineer or producer. Um, but I think eventually at some point you're going to be doing something in your career and you're going to realize you have no idea how the business works. And you're going to realize that that's in fact a deficit. Um, students that come out of the well-crafted programs, again, at the universities I named before, learning about the music business and how it works um, from a business structure point of view, from a legal structure point of view, from a social responsibility and sort of, you know, cultural point of view, those are all things that are part of the curriculum in what I would consider to be good music business, liberal arts education. As if, if you're interested in going to one of these um, universities, should you take the time to look at who the, the professors are, who's going to be teaching to see what their background is, where they came from? Absolutely. I mean, I think in this particular discipline, it's absolutely critical to have faculty that have done it, right? That have been in the music business that understand how it works. I mean, one of the things that is particularly impressive, let's say about NYU's faculty is not only um, are all our faculty people who have had um, extensive high level experience in, in all aspects of the music business, but um, they uh, all have ad advanced degrees, right? And um, have, are people that uh, come to teaching from not only a love of the music business, but, but a real interest in sort of how to put the music business into an academic setting. I mean, my background, my academic background is uh, American studies, politics and culture, right? I've written a lot about how music can be used as a window to look at culture, politics and history of a certain time period. Um, I'm interested in how music influences the way we live, right? So, um, so, I think it's very important that you look at the faculty and see two things. One, are they people that, that have sort of a broad interest in music that, and can teach it? And two, do they have the background in the business where they can really provide students with information and connections that, that matter? I mean, what I always say to my students is, listen guys, especially I teach in the graduate school at NYU too, and I teach a very high level music publishing course. And I always say to them, Listen, guys, I am, we are creating a toolbox here. This entire semester, you are going to be creating a toolbox. And you're going to be putting all kinds of tools in this box. And I'm going to be talking to you about how you can use this various, these various tools. But when you get out and you get into the real music business, you are going to face situations and face deal structures and face interactions that we may not have talked about in class. That's how you have, that's why you have your toolbox. Because you'll be able to say, hmm, never encountered this before, but I know that I've got two tools in here that I can use to help me deal with it. Exactly. And, and that's the kind of, um, you know, teaching that, that I try to do, that, that my colleagues try to do, and um, that I think, you know, makes these kinds of programs worthwhile. I have to say, Mike, I'm the, the mother of two, uh, one, one son just graduated, the other one's still in college. And I, I look at those tuition bills I, and I see what's going on out there. And when I first was asked to start teaching, because I had given a lot of lectures over the course of my career. And when I was first asked to start teaching, I thought, wait a minute, a degree in the music business? Like, just go get a job in the music business and work yeah, exactly. for 10 years. There's your degree. Exactly. Like, are you kidding me? I couldn't believe it. And But then when I started writing curriculum, and, and looking at what these degree programs at the good schools are really about, I was really into it. I mean, when I teach my music publishing class, we start with the constitution. We start with the founding fathers and we look historically at their concept of copyright and why that mattered and why that was important to the evolution of America as a free and creative society. So, you know, we, what I've learned is that um, in the right setting with the right professors and the, and the right faculty and the right programming, um, these, these programs are, you know, they, they change the lives of students and they teach them a lot about the world 
through music, through music as a commodity, through music as a social, um, as, a, as, a, as a mechanism for social change, um, for music as, as a creative art, right? We, we look at it through all these different angles. Now, we know the music industry changes so fast. I mean, you know, and, and, and we're not talking about just, you know, what Napster did, but we're literally talking like every day, something new is probably being revealed, right. discovered, you know, developed. How do these programs stay on top of the fast changing, fast evolving music business that, you know, you start at the beginning of the quarter and at the end of the quarter, it might be a completely different world. Well, you're talking about the, in my opinion, what I would call sort of the fiduciary responsibility of the faculty. It's our responsibility to be constantly on top of everything that's going on in the business. That's why so many of us are professors, but also have other, um, you know, uh, other responsibilities within the business, do lots of other things. Um, I'm reading all the time. I'm talking to people in the music business all the time. I'm, you know, the global co-chair of mentorship for She Is The Music, which is Alicia Keys and Jody Gerson's uh, organization to promote um, women uh, in music. And I'm constantly talking to major people all the time about everything that's going on in the business. So it's, it's up to us not only to be responsible for, what, for knowing what's going on in the business, but to dig a little bit deeper into these changes that happen literally every week. As I tell my students, you better keep up on stuff because the business changes every week so that I can explain it to my students. For instance, the Music Modernization Act, which is a you know, seismic piece of legislation, flawed, that was just passed that's going to change the way creators earn money. Um, not only do I consider myself a little bit of an expert on that because I have to teach it, but my students do full on research papers on it to understand the impact that this piece of legislation is gonna have on the business. Um, I am constantly making sure I know what I'm talking about because let me tell you, these students they are on top of it and you don't want to be the person that gets a question that you cannot answer. And if you do get that question that you can't answer, you know, I'll say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. Let me check. I'll get back to you. But you have got the good faculty is on top of their game all the time. And, and we're writing about it. I mean, that's part of our responsibility as professors is to look at things in our area of study and our discipline and, you know, dissect it and write about it. Do these courses create a fictitious band that as a class you develop and try and get signed and go, you know, to learn the ropes of all of it? Because, you know, one of the things I'm always telling artists that I work with is, you know, you think it's just a matter of recording an album and distributing it, but I can guarantee you every single release, there's going to be an unknown out there. You just don't know what that unknown is. Right. And it's experience that will allow you to react quickly. And like you said, go to your toolbox and go, okay, the, the, the instant grat track didn't go live when it was supposed to. How do I remedy this? What does that mean to my entire marketing rollout? That's stuff you get from experience. Do you build these sample you know, projects in these courses? Sure. I mean, professors have all different kinds of projects all the time. You know, if you're in a marketing course or you're in a, um, we have a, a, a course called International Music Marketplace, where students look at the international music marketplace, figure out how various markets work, what to do in those markets. Yeah, there, we, we do this all the time. Touring and concert promotion, they're, they're crafting, you know, fake tours. I hate to use that fake fake word because right. it's like fake news, but um, not a fan, I have to say. But, um, you know, they, they create, we create all kinds of things. For instance, in my music publishing course, um, we look at sync, obviously one of the biggest um, income streams for, for songwriters today. And what my students do is they do a project where they take an existing sync, one that exists already. They 
investigate every aspect of it, how the deal was made, blah, 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 everything they know, everything about it, what they can. And then what they do is they look at it creatively and see if they could have used another song copyright and swap it in to that existing visual. And how would that work? And how would they do that? And, and how would they explain that? So we, we do this stuff all the time. This is, these courses and these programs, if they're done right, are all based on what's happening currently in the 21st century music industry. Of course, we do a lot of, um, of looking at the history of the music business, the recorded music business from various angles, because if you don't know what happened before, you may not be ready for what's happening um, you know, in the future. And, and we look at aspects of the traditional business that we still use that are still important. Um, and we, we talk about, um, you know, uh, we, we talk about things that, um, that have helped uh, define the business and the changes in the business over the last 70 years of the music business. And the number one thing that drives the music business is technology, changes in technology. So we talk a lot about keeping your eye on technology and understanding not only how those changes have changed the business, but how the business has reacted to those changes. And sometimes the business didn't react appropriately or in time. You and I both know this. Yep. Um, and what happens if you, if you are trying to push back against changes in technology? Um, I'm assuming you've got courses that teach stuff like management and maybe even A&R. Yep. Um, th th those are two areas in the music business that obviously have a lot of educated skills behind them. You've got to know the business, but there are also two parts where it's, you know, there's the old running joke. If you're going to be a manager, you're going to be the band's mother as well. Um, how do you teach that sort of stuff? The, 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 the psychology, the personal engagement to, you know, as an A&R rep, how do you how do you learn that you need to go in and suggest to your artist that that lead guitar player isn't going to cut it in your band and they need to be removed? That's not a book skill. That's a exactly. personality and, skill. You know, look, it, it's, it's hard to teach that. I mean, it, you, look, we all know that people are successful in our business because of who they are innately as people, right? How are they able to communicate? How are they able to assess a situation and then determine what the best uh, route to take is? I mean, that's why uh, the liberal arts aspect of this kind of education is important, right? So I'm a former a and executive. You know, my entire career has been based on being an artist advocate as a music publisher, as an a and person, managing producers. I do lots of a and consulting, right? So. A lot of what my students learn is from my own experiences and from some readings we do and from we bring in a lot of guests. We have a lot of people that come to our program at NYU that talk about what they do and their experiences. And, you know, we run a couple different type of A&R courses at um, NYU. We run one that's about um, talent assessment. What do you do? What skills are needed to assess talent? What are you looking for? I run one in our January term in Nashville in partnership with Universal Music Group where I take students to Nashville for three weeks and we actually A&R and record in Berry Hill, the famous Berry Hill Studios, uh, emerging Nashville talent, where the students spend three weeks in the studio acting as A&R person and producer with you know, Grammy winning engineers like David Leonard, who did all the Prince stuff and you know whatever, they're the on-site instructors. So they actually, students actually begin to understand the A&R process. But what's so interesting about this course is that they're working with real artists and the most, the best learning that's come out of it is when they've watched the artist and one of our top exec, you know, top line professional producers have a disagreement. And how does the producer in the studio negotiate that conversation about whether a vocal take is actually good or not, right? How do you deal with an artist who comes into the studio unprepared? These are not things you can learn in a book. This is 
these are things that you have to learn from experience. So we're very big on um, experiential programs, um, at least at NYU. Um, that's part of the reason why Larry Miller, who is the program director of our program, hired me because I build those kind of programs because I know what it's like as an A&R person, so I want to bring that to my students. Um, so they're in real world situations and they're watching professionals and, and sometimes they're participating. Uh, I've had students, especially after the Nashville program, say to me, wow, you have to be like a psychiatrist to deal with artists in the studio. I'm like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You have to be. You're their girlfriend. You're their mother. You're their shrink. Counselor, you're their, everything. Yeah, counselor. You're their social worker. You're Therapist. all those things. So yeah, these are the kinds of um, things that students really learn because they're being taught by professionals and we put them in these kind of experiential situations. What's the admission process like for some of these better universities, better courses? What do you, what do you, you know, is it, is it all about the GPA you're bringing from, co from high school? Is it about outside experience? Is it all mixed together? Um, well, I, I can only speak for what I know about um, the universities I've worked at, but I, I, I think it's pretty similar across the board. You know, first of all, you have to look at, you know, sort of the level of the university you're applying to. Obviously, if you're looking at a program at one of the more elite universities, you know, your GPA, your test scores, if they're still accepting them, I think the test scores are ridiculous, but they use them in college admissions, right? Um, are going to be important just to get you in the door. You know, if you're trying to get into USC or NYU, right, just to get in the door, forget about the music business program, just to be considered by NYU, you have to, you know, you have to make sure that you, you meet the statistics, the stats they're right. looking for. After that, for music programs, one of the most important things you can do is demonstrate your passion for, for music. Either you're a player or you've been out there you know, managing your friend's band or you worked, you know, at the local club or you're a, you do a podcast or you write a blog or whatever you're doing, demonstrate your passion for music and be able to articulate in some way why you want to be in the music business. We don't expect students to know that they want to be the digital media marketing manager because they may not even know what that is but they should be able to articulate what their areas of interest are. And, and I think that's really important for, for NYU's program. It's really important to show us that you really want to be in the music business um, and that you're not just applying because, oh, music business, that sounds cool. Believe me, most parents don't even understand what this is. So you can't just do it because it sounds cool because your parents, are at, at, at the very least, you're gonna say, wait a minute, what kind of thing is this? You know, I've had many parents on the phone asking me to explain what this is. So um, I, I think it's, you know, it's your, uh, certainly your high school credentials and they should meet the requirements of the university you're applying to, but also your ability to demonstrate why you want to be in our program. Why should, what are you gonna to bring to the program? And what are you gonna get out of our program? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with the, 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 the concept of passion. To me, that's the biggest thing you can bring. You oh, wait, I, I, I've, I've always said you can't just wake up and go, I'm going to be, be working in the music industry. You can have that as a dream, but it's your passion that's going to drive you there. And it's your passion that's going to allow you to do things without sitting back and going, well, Am I going to gain anything by doing this? Am I going to make any money by doing this? No, if it's a passion, you're just going to do it because you love it. And I firmly believe eventually that passion will be recognized by somebody out there. It's exactly. just a matter of the time and the place, but you'll land in front of somebody and they're going to go, wow, look at the passion they have for the music. I can train them to be that digital marketing person, but I can't train passion and love for music. Right. That, that's exactly how I got my first job. I mean, you know, I, I graduated, my undergraduate degree was from Brandeis University, um, you know, in the mid 1980s when 
you know, again, nobody knows how to get into the music business, although Brandeis has had a few people that have gone on to huge careers in the music business. But um, I, I just knew when I graduated, I was supposed to go to law school and I actually asked my parents if they'd give me a year to try to work in the music business. And, you know, um, I knew that I kind of couldn't do anything else. I had worked at the college radio station. I wrote music reviews for the paper. You know, Brandeis is in Boston. I saw hundreds of shows. I was one of those kind of people. And so they said, sure, we'll give you a year to figure it out. And I'm truly convinced that the reason I got my first job, there are two reasons why I got my first job at Chapel Music. One, I was a good writer. I learned how to write in college. I was a good writer. So my boss needed me to write all kinds of stuff for her. She'd want to do it. So I was a good writer. And two, I just kept talking endlessly about every band I knew and everything. And she finally said to me, oh my God, she said like, this is your life. I said, exactly. The passion was there. I did not, I couldn't tell you what ASCAP or BMI was. I knew nothing about music publishing. As a matter of fact, I felt kind of disappointed that I didn't take the job that I was offered at Chrysalis Records at the time, because Chrysalis just seemed much cooler. It was a record company, I understood that. But I couldn't be more grateful that I started the music publishing business because I started and I learned from the brilliant, the, the quintessential music publisher, Erwin Robinson, who is a, a legend. And I learned um, everything that a person really needs to know to be successful in the music business, because it starts with the song and copyright. And I couldn't, I think it's the best place to start. But literally I got the job because I could write decently and because I was a music freak. So my boss said, okay. And I learned everything from there. I, I literally, you know, all of us at that time, we learned, we learned from there. Yep. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my start was, I just need, you know, I was brought up in Minnesota. So it was not the hotbed of where you're going to find, as you said, music industry jobs. I go to college. Wow. I can work in the college radio. That's a step into. Exactly. That's what industry. I did. Yeah. And then I got to know all of these record label reps, management companies, independent bands, and everybody got resumes and I became friends with them remotely be by the phone and stuff like that. And one of them took me and said, we, we see your passion. We want you to work with our band. A management company said right. work with our band. And then it was just off from right. that point. You know, the, I guess the one thing I, I could say is because of the way the music industry evolves so fast, you have to be prepared for a career change within the industry at a moment's notice mm -hmm. that you can't be so set in your ways that all I'm going to do is this because that job function could be completely eliminated in six months and blindside you. Right. That, that's why I always, I learn to appreciate having been trained in the music publishing business because in the music publishing business, even more so today than when I started, you deal with every aspect of the music business. You deal with everybody. Um, and, and so I, I learned so much and I was given so many opportunities there at Warner Chapel um, that uh, I felt like, you know, you could throw almost anything at me and I'll have a tool for it. Right. I may not know the answer, but I'll have a tool for it. I'll, 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 I'll at least tackle the problem. I can't promise exactly. you that I'll succeed with it, but I'll take it on without question. Right. Or I'll know who to call. <laughs> yeah, no, you're exactly right. Right. Um, Susan, this has been fascinating. And, and, and honestly, I sit back and go, man, I wish all of this existed when I was in college in the 80s. It was like, it would be so much easier to just go to oh, sure. a music sure. program. Um, where can our listeners um, reach out to you to get more information if they've got questions? Um, the best place for them to find me would probably be at NYU. Um, my email at NYU is s for Susan L for Lee D for Dotus, the number 10 at nyu.edu. Uh, and I will, you know, point people in the right direction um, if they have any questions. And I urge, you know, people who are interested in um, a music business, uh, university education, to really look around at, at all the programs, all the different universities that offer these programs, 
and you know figure out if if one of these programs speaks to them um because there's a lot of good ones you know nyu is great but there there there, there are a lot of good ones and there are many not so good ones oh you so. you're 100 right i mean you know as surprised as it is the college i graduated in southern minnesota has had a music business program for the last few years now i would have i would have been over the top in excitement if they had that when i was there sure exactly um do you speak at it? They should have you there. I, I, I have, oh, you know, right before the virus hit, I was doing a lot of uh, um, Zoom and Skype guest lecturing to the students. Right. Um, which is great. Which was great because it was my, it's my, you know, it's my old university. I right. got a little, little love for it. But right. um, yeah, it's, the, the programs are out there. They're really starting to pop up more and more places. Right. But I think to how this whole thing started, you've got to do some homework to make sure you're getting into a Absolutely. legit program and not just somebody who's looking to make some money off of you for the quarter. Exactly. And, and remember, you know, I think the most successful people in the music business are people who come from different backgrounds, who can talk about different things, which is why a liberal arts education, I think is so integral to being successful in the music business. I mean, after all, you're dealing with an art form, you're dealing with creators who are expressing, you know, a, a personal experience or a global experience, right? So to be able to relate to that, that requires, you know, having to have, having to have had some sort of, you know, experience with, reading novels and reading books and yep. knowing history and understanding art and you know geography and and all the things that we learn you know different languages in a liberal arts education and i think um you know the, the best programs from my perspective are the ones that bring that liberal arts piece into the music industry uh education and courses that you're taking and, um, you know, I think NYU does it well, and there are others that also do it well. Yeah, I agree completely. I agree completely. Susan, this was, this was fascinating. It was awesome. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I love, I love, you know, we don't get into this as much as we should, but this is something Jay and I both love is, we've, we always say, you've got to educate yourself in this business, right. especially if you're, if you are an artist, a musician, a performer, more than ever, you have to be educated because the contracts are changing, the payouts are changing, Absolutely. you know, who's paying you, who's getting the money, who's collecting it, why aren't they s splitting it with you? You need to know all this stuff so you don't freak out when that first check is for two cents. Exactly. I mean, I do a lot of, I work with the Rattle in LA, I do a lot of um, sort of now in the zoom era you know zoom classes with creators or with other with other universities sometimes i'm a guest to talk about these things because you you can't survive in the business unless you know how it works and um you know so many people just jump in and have no idea sort of how any how anything works and you know this is why i love your your guys podcast because you have several episodes that speak directly to specific areas that I want my students to understand. Like I said, I can teach this to them in the classroom, but then when they hear from an expert on your podcast, it, you know, it just emphasizes and reinforces the stuff we're talking about in the classroom. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of what you guys thank do you. and I appreciate it. And I, and I thank you and my students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they're so all much. fans now, so um, I'm. I'm just. It's been great that you they asked me to come on and chat for a little while. Awesome, Susan. This was this was this was great. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Thank you. I guess you'll be in touch and let me know when or if you're airing this. Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of a hundred units or more, a hundred and fifty dollar value. Love that conversation with Susan. So much great information. Man, you know, when I was back in college and wanted to break into the music business, I sure wish there was a lot of these programs back then. So if this is something that's interesting to you, that you want to get into the music business, check out everything that Susan's been talking about. Reach out, ask her some questions. Um, it's I think it'll be well worth your time. So as a 
quick mention, just thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters, HypeBot.com, BandsInTown.com, DiscMakers.com. Thank you for everything you do to continue to support the Music Biz Weekly podcast. And of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that little red subscribe button. If you're listening on Spotify, follow us. And if you're listening on iTunes, make sure you subscribe, leave a review and a rating. You don't want to miss another episode of the Music Biz Weekly podcast. Jay will be back with us next week. That's it. Take care, everyone.